Hey, folks, welcome back to The Pulse. My name's Matt. This is Crypto Heartbeat. It is Friday. It is Stephen Friday once again, and I've got incredible hair light today. The light's coming in from above. I have the, the halo of light. My son thinks that he can be a professional meme maker. He's kind of gotten that idea. He watches, you know, YouTube, and he thinks that, hey, Dad, I just want to get paid to make memes. I'm like, who's paying for memes? I don't know who's paying for memes, but he thinks that's the case. But do you know this meme? It's wag me. You know it, right? I didn't know it. I'm kind of an old man. We are going to make it. That's what they say, right? You're in the bear market. And you're like, I don't know which way's up. It's all crumbling apart. Well, there's actually a really interesting story in that that we're going to be talking about today. And that's really wag me. I learned something about we are going to make it. Why are we going to make it? Because Jesus is alive and he speaks. And I had an experience that I'm going to share with you today, but I can't share it with you because I have to share it with Steve. What's up, Steve? <laughs> hey, man, how you doing? I'm 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 alive. <laughs> alive I'm, and kicking. I'm I'm here, and so yeah. I figure if I'm here, there's something to do. So yeah, let's right. do this. Um, but it's so good to see you. I know you were traveling and all that stuff. Uh, rough week or tough week or I mean, how well, are you it was, yeah, it was a tough week. I mean. Um, my my best friend in Oklahoma City, um, his wife suddenly passed on on Friday night, and wow. and so you know when I mean you know how do you deal with that if you're how do you if deal with got, it? yeah how do you deal with it so it's um, I mean she's doing great she doesn't think she got the short straw at all that's right I mean, so she's doing great but it's the rest of us that are kind of wow, now what? I mean, because it, it's a major change in life for both, right? She's good, yep. she's entering into a totally different way of living. And and now her husband is um, is now entering that in a different way. And so it yeah. was it was a little tough that way. Yeah, Celebration like while still being a little tough. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. So if you're watching this and you're in the chat, and you're a fan of the new audio from Steve Staggs. Yeah, you need right. to give him a shout out. You got a new mic, man. You sound great. Well, you know, we've been threatening to do this for a while. And finally, I don't know. I guess we just kind of wanted to ease into it. So we didn't pull, yeah. pull any muscles along the way or something. Right. I don't yeah, know. You don't, but... you don't want to shock anybody with the, uh, the radio announcer voice that you have. Right. Um, but yeah, so Steve's got the, uh, the new mic, which is nice. Um, we've got some, some folks here. Mike Ostell, of course, is number one. He said, beware evil is a foot. The closer yeah. you are to Jesus, the more the devil will throw at you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He is the light. You know, right. you know, Mike, Michael may be reading my mail, Steve. <laughs> he kind of set the headline, didn't he? <laughs> he sure did. He says in warm greetings to the RSU friends, the right side up friends. Yeah. And there is. Uh, crypto compassion as well. Hello, good to see you. And then your buddy, Southern SoCal, yeah. your SoCal brother, Kadium. Yeah, Kadium. Yeah, he was. I mean, you guys are kind of same. You're contemporaries, right? Oh yeah, we yeah. we probably lived maybe 30, 40 miles apart from each other. Had all the same experiences. Of course, we learned all of that when we were at the Gen Con. Yes. And it's like, whoa, dude, you know exactly. Were you following me around? He said, I don't know about, how about you? Were you following me? Wow. And so we were, yeah, we had a lot of fun and That's still cool. do and still do. Well, that was a, what a time in Southern California too. Cause yeah. you know, I look at how things have gotten in LA area and it's, it's, it's sad. Actually, I was there in the mid nineties and there's still some bright spots. Um, it was still pretty tough, but my understanding is, what a time to be alive in, in, was this, was this, this was the seventies, wasn't it? The seventies. Yeah. The 60s in and Cal 70s. Yeah. yeah the sixties and seventies. Yeah. What a wonderful time. Uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of good stuff happening out there. And it wasn't, it wasn't the LA of today. No, very, very different. Um, and you know, I, I write about it in the sixties, you know, white yeah. paper, you know, somewhat is that, Literally within one summer, uh, a tidal wave um, of influence came in that completely changed the entire dynamic of, of that area and the culture. 
and we're living the results of it today. And, you know, you see it in San Francisco, you see it here. I mean, it's just really bizarre. Anyway, Katie and I were reminiscing about all of that and talking about it. So we have a lot in common. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, welcome, KDM. Good to see you. Hello to you. Um, so we are, yeah, seeing the same today. That's right. Yeah. Um, okay, so you and I have kind of walked through some interesting things here over the last week, and it's been crazy over the last kind of 19 days here in January, kind of a, a weird new year. And I learned something really, I learned something really um I think really pivotal and it's funny, like, you know, you're 51 and you learn this stuff, but you know, I think you get glimpses of it, but this was probably one of the most, you know, uh, what should I say? Um, significant, right. And, and, and really like I under, I've understood a lot about what, what, uh, how things work. And so let me kind of recount that to you. And I want you to kind of share, this perspective because I'm still kind of processing it. Right. And there's, cause there's so much to it. You know, when we talk about being able to probe something that's true. Yeah. So just for those that are watching, um, just dealing with some really significant financial issues right now. And I mean, I've dealt with these things before, but you know, it's in this process. You're trying to manage a business. You're trying to provide for all kinds of people. You're trying to advance everything. Right. And, there's a lot that's going on. Um, and I think a lot of times, you know, there's different types of challenges. And, you know, what's funny is I think when you're in financial challenges or whatever challenge you're in, you think that that's the biggest challenge. And then I think about, I'm like, well, no, it's not a health challenge, right? I think about my buddy, David Lee, who's in the chat, you know, mm -hmm. and I think about that. I wouldn't even compare things, right? And it's like, you know, and I had a buddy say to me, he's like, how are your kids doing? How's your family doing? How's your marriage doing? Right. You don't have problems. He basically said to me, but you know, when you're in the midst of these things, the challenges seem overwhelming. And I, I really want to use that kind of universally in, in this kind of time together is really to try to telegraph the meaning of this because it's really significant. It still is really significant for me. And so dealing with this and feeling overwhelmed and feeling like there was no way out and what was amazing is I had this really tough conversation with a friend. And what was amazing is you texted me out of the blue at the end of the day. And we normally don't like, that's not usually when we connect. And so it was for me, really interesting that you at that exact time were like, Hey man, you got a couple minutes. Cause it's just not how we typically do it. And I'm like, wow, that's, you know, the timing of this is really unique. And of course you said, Hey man, how you doing? And I'm like, not so good. And you're like, do you mind telling me about it? And I tell you about it. And what was really interesting is I use the term, you know, I know Jesus has got it. And so I want to start there, Steve, is I think a lot of times those of us who believe and understand and have seen amazing things happen in this world, and we recognize and we articulate a love for Jesus, right? We're like, yeah, he's awesome. And you know, and I think that in general Christianity, we would say, well, yeah, of course, Jesus is this. And it's one thing to kind of give it lip service and to kind of agree. And it's another thing for it to actually be extremely relevant, right, in the moment. And so I think, so you said to me, you said, I hear you saying that, that Jesus has got it, and you're right. However, do you got it that he's got it? And I didn't really realize it took me about 12 hours to really understand what you meant there. And of course, Jesus just drove it straight home for me in a very gentle way. Yeah. What did you mean by that? So when you asked me that question, which was like the question I needed to be asked, what does that mean to you? Like, what did you see in all of that? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I seem to be saying this a lot in our more recent um our more recent streams about you know, another great question because um, each one of them is gets deeper and deeper and deeper into the reality of the things that we have been talking about. Yeah. <clears throat> and let me describe that just real briefly as kind of a back backdrop to, to this. Um, we don't realize it uh, because we, 
we have been told or made to think something different, but we have really been taught within the Christian dynamic, within the church world, to be academics. Yep. And so the great prize in life is to be able to know the Bible, quote it back and forth, be able to teach and preach and talk all about it. We're marvelous academics. The only thing about an academic is he studies, he or she studies things that have already happened, they're historic in nature, and you view them from a distance. Well, that's okay as an introduction, but that isn't where Jesus lives, that isn't where he keeps us. And so if you want to hang with him, he takes you beyond the academic knowing about stuff to actually getting in the middle to know it. Hmm. And, in, and in the English language, we only have one word, know. Uh, now we have some cinnamon, synonyms like understand, you know, or the deeper level of comprehend. But um, in the biblical context, there are different words for knowing. And one of them is to know by personal firsthand experience. And there's a whole parable about that. You know, and in Mark chapter four, the the great parable that you, um, you know, have has really struck home to you, where the disciple, few of the disciples ran after him, said, "Okay, dude, what what do you mean by this?" He goes in there and he says, "How will you then know all the parables if you don't understand know this one?" Huh. So if you know it by observation. How will you then get to know it by firsthand personal experience? If you don't know by observation and then learn by firsthand personal experience what this parable means. Yeah. Well, right there, he is, our language doesn't have the ability to communicate that. But it is wonderfully communicated, you know, in the Greek language. So, now, what does that have to do with your question? Well, it's not a big stretch. Once you, once you start getting acquainted with God, you know, in how he does things and who he is, it's not hard to say, I know he's got this. Right. Because your whole philosophical foundation is based on that. He's omnipotent, he's omnipresent, he's all-knowing. And so if a being who is supreme above all others, well, of course he's got it. Yeah. See, so that's not a big deal. So we are trained that, that he's got it. But then there's the next level, which is where he says it to you. Matt, I've got this. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. So we've just moved from the concept that he's got it. Okay, that aligns with my theological premise. Of course he does. He has to. Otherwise, he couldn't be all the things that I say that he is. But now he has said to me, hey, I've got this. Whoa, well... We then have a, we then have some choices, don't we? And I'm yeah. now I'm now relating this to you personally, and then going to you know what I meant by the next one in my experience. Well, now he's taking me to the next step where okay, I'm just not giving you a philosophical framework. I'm now telling you specifically, Matt, I've got this. Well, what we then have the choice of doing is exactly like those, fo those folks in Mark 4. Am I going to assume that he's just assuring me, or am I going to say, well, what do you have, what do you have in mind there when, when you say that to me? Well, okay, let's take a step back. If I say I've got this, first of all, what do you first think when I say that? 
And all of a sudden you get a chance to say, oh, wow, whatever your particular interest is. Well, that means he's got it financially. Okay, well, why would we think that in the context of your opening, right? Well, I'm, I'm in a time when I need some, you know, some finances. I've got that. And so we then leap to the thing of our direct need, finances. And so our focus becomes very narrow when he has said something very broad. Mm -hmm. I've got this. Well, when he says, I've got that, hmm. That means that nothing that intersects this is beyond his direct and immediate reign. I've got this. There's nothing that enters into this domain, enters into this world, enters into this situation. There's nothing that exits from it that I don't got. <laughs> Okay. Oh, well, okay. Man, that's a lot bigger than I thought you got my finances covered. Yeah. See, all of a sudden, man, that thing starts getting really big. So he takes us from the concept of knowing, then to the assurance and a direct comment to knowing, to then expanding our perspective about what that means and entails if he's got it, and then it hits home to us. Do I really get that he's got it? Or am I just transferring to him, he's got it, while I sit there in this state of total panic or confusion or wondering, especially that I've even heard to him correctly? And so all of a sudden, I start, I start seeing all of the things that are going on in me that, well, it doesn't really matter if he's got it, if I don't get that he's got it. That ah, kind of talks about James 1, right? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. But let him ask in faith, not wavering, lest he become like one who is tossed here and there, being a double-minded man. Huh. Well, guess what you're learning in that situation? Oh, there's really two minds going on here. There's the mind of the academic who philosophically deals with things. There's the mind of Jesus who's absolutely assured. Ab there is no deviation from what he is saying. There is no insecurity. I've got this, Matt. And then there's my mind. And my mind is not being benefited by the concept that he's got it. As a matter of fact, it's not really much helping that I know he's got it because this thing that I need is looming so large. So getting to the place where we get it, that he's got it, that is the big work. And so everything that then flows into that starts being viewed from a different perspective once that actually starts to land. And so what it meant for me when I said, do you got it? It's okay, Matt, you're not done with this particular journey. You've got another step or two to take. Yep. And it's important that you take that because everything that's coming into this situation is light and it's revealing something. Yep. So if your issue is money, that money is revealing things. Are you prepared to see them, what it's revealing, or are you still wound up still in the lack or what you think is the lack that you're not able to take advantage of to see what Jesus is showing you in the middle of this thing? Yeah. And so that's what, having gone through my own firsthand personal experience with this uh, a number of times, uh, I, st I said, okay, man, this is it. And let me, you're going to enjoy this once you get through it because it's going to be profound. Oh, and and you will eventually become just as secure as he is in his statement. You'll become that way as well. 
So that's what I meant. <sighs> well, Steve, you know, it's funny is I think because you're so clear and disciplined and precise in your language, I think sometimes even when I listen to you, I'm like, I could imagine you sounding like you're speaking a parable. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Because it is so clear and it is so precise. And I want to, I think part of the role I have to play in all of this is to say it back to you yeah. in kind of, you know, here's what I experience. What we're talking about here to me is one of the most important things in all of creation. Yeah. It, it feels that way to me because it's so profound. You know, we think about what is the value of Jesus? What is the value of faith? What is the value of this whole thing? Why, why does it even matter? And it all comes, in my opinion, down to this. Yeah. If there are no reward, if there is no benefit, if there is no outcome that is better, right? And those of us who have been academic about the Bible, we would say, well, it's a peace that transcends all understanding. It's a straight path. It's while he is the supreme being, all things were made for him and by him. I, all of these things that I might know or might have memorized or might have learned, like you're saying, is knowledge. Where the rubber meets the road and the practical nature of this stuff is, and the beauty of it is, I think you couldn't have said it better that this is the exposure of the light in all of these cases. And to me, it's, it's where it all, it's all kind of come to a point. Rather than judging me, he didn't say to me, you have no faith, you punk. He didn't <laughs> yeah. say that to me. No. And nor did you. No. He said, do you got it that I've got it? And I think the thing that really got me was that night, I woke up at 2.37. And you said to me during that conversation, because I was still kind of you know, if, if to use kind of your language, I was still kind of covered up by it, right? I was still, yeah. I was still like, it was, it was kind of overwhelming, right? I was in the midst of this. I didn't know which way was up. And here you call at this precise time and share this. And I'm like, okay, what does this mean? And of course, everything you always tell me is, hey, ask him yourself. But what I found was this, and this is so huge. I think in the past when I really haven't had need, I would pray. And I would pray like they taught me in church. Hmm. Hey, Jesus, you're awesome. And I need some stuff and, you know, you know, help this person and, you know, this kind of generic stuff. What I came to realize in this moment, and I've seen it before, but it's like technicolor, is you have nothing to say. I have nothing to request. All I can say is, how do you see this? Because I don't have a good view of it. And I think what happens is it's almost that's really at the core of all of this. He's trying to get us to the point where, are you going to lean on your own understandings or are you going to ask me how I see this? And it's interesting because it, it goes from being a request or, hey, here's my list of things that I'm interested in. And hey, why don't you come my way? And it's like, okay, I'm into this position so far. And it seems like all is lost. It, it, it seems as if it's all going to break apart. And what's amazing about it is like, no, there's a reason that it needs to be this painful. And of course, then what comes to mind is consider it pure joy. I'm like, I don't know that I'm very good at considering it pure joy when facing trials of many kinds. I'm not very good at that. Like when I'm facing troubles of many kinds, I, I'm not, I don't consider it joy at all. It's actually quite painful, sir. And what is amazing about this is I realized something really, really, really profound. And it was cool because you said to me, you know, and, and this is how I took it. You didn't say these exact words, but it's like you're too close to it. I literally, and we were talking about the money, right? And if you think about it, like, you're right. We're so narrowly focused on this one thing. And Jesus's perspective is from a high place, right? He yeah. is, the hell's going on? I don't know what the hell's going on, Steve. <laughs> so right. all I can do is go, you obviously see this differently than I do. So let me ask you. How do you see this? Yes. And he goes, ah, that's the key. Okay, yes. so now how do you see this? And what he put in my mind was that big lazy Susan. Yes. You know, and if you guys don't know, there's, so there's this big round table in front of me. And in this is this big lazy Susan. And of course, if you've ever eaten at a table that's got a big lazy Susan, it's pretty cool because you can put the food on it and spin it around. 
right? And everybody gets to kind of share because you've got this big lazy Susan, right? So he literally puts the money on it. And in my mind, while I'm talking to you, Steve, he takes that and moves that away from me. So imagine it's right up close and he pushes it all the way 180 degrees to the back. And so, you know, you've heard people say you can't see the forest for the trees. And that's kind of what it was. It's like, all right, let's put this in its proper place. And so that was helpful in that moment, right? I'm like, okay, so yeah, I'm too close to this. So, and then of course you were like, hey, there's more to this. So, all right, if I'm supposed to consider it pure joy when facing these troubles, then there's a purpose in them. And what really struck home for me, Steve, was if I if I truly believe that he's got it, you ask the exact right question. Do you got that he's got it? And what's so cool is I had, um, you're going to love this, dude. I, 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 uh, I asked AI to give me an image. <laughs> And, he, and AI gave me an image. He's like, I got it. You got it? I, th I thought you'd get a kick out of that. Um, and and it's, really, it's really amazing because I did get it. And so I woke up at 237. And I've got it like this heavy weighted blanket, my CPAP, right? Old man crypto heartbeat, right? And of course, you can breathe under that because you've got like a pipe coming in. And I literally am just like, all right, Lord, how do you see this? And this is what he says to me. He shows me an image of a plate, and that plate is glass, and that plate is falling onto a hard surface. The plate is transparent, it's made of glass, and it's falling. And around that is money. And of course, in this falling of the plate, imagine something falling that is almost like it's tumbling because of the wind. And uh, I had AI create an image of that too. So. <laughs> Let, let's let's look at what that looks like because I, I want you guys this is so huge to me that i want to share it with you um <laughs> hang on hang on a second i gotta pull it up here um and it's so profound that it's like and what i love about it is that he communicated with me in imagery and in I saw it and I heard it. Yeah. And I think that that's really, really cool that it was, you know, it was both and. Yes. Um, and so, all right, here we go. I'll just have to do it this way. Share screen window. Okay. Share. Okay. So this is the, this is the image. Okay. And this is about as good as it gets, right? It was probably not this up close. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. So I see this plate falling, it's transparent plate, and I see this money, right? And I'm like, this is going to break apart. And he says, it's not falling apart. It's falling in place. Okay, so this yeah. was essentially, but I saw this all in motion. And so this is humongous stuff. Like, I mean, absolutely mind-numbing things, because I think what it's showing is this is how it works. Whatever the situation, this is the framework of how it works. I don't know, like, I can't force it, but I know that this is the framework of how it works. I ask him, how do you see this? And he says, this needs to be moved away from you. You need to understand what this financial thing is. And anything, it could be, yes. what is this yes. cancer? What is yes. this sudden death? What yes. is this, whatever it is. If we believe he's the supreme being and that he has this perspective, then what I've noticed since then is he's done 80 things, and I was thinking he was doing one thing. I, I attributed to him, you've got it means you've got the money. No, no, no. He's like, no. I have the cattle are on a thousand hills. I have all of it, right? But what I have, you don't even know what I've got because I've got it all. Yeah. And so what was amazing about it is I saw this image and I'm like, okay, so what you're saying is that in the falling of this and in the anticipation and the natural of it crashing to pieces and falling apart, you're using that strain, you're using that pain to expose the truth in me. Yeah. What, is he, what did he expose in me? You don't really believe that I've got it. You're paying lip service to me. You don't really believe that I've got it. 
but I'm going to show you that I've got it because I'm a loving father and I don't destroy you. And I'm like, okay, well, thank you for, for not destroying me. <laughs> but then what ended up happening out of that is a number of relationships that were around this issue of the challenges of this proved themselves. And there were a number of things that literally since then has said, I needed to use this to vet out and to expose the truth. And it wasn't just in me, but it was in me yeah. to expose to you that you don't see things the way I see things. And it makes me humbled to go, I got to stop making a list for Jesus. I need to start <laughs> asking him how he sees stuff. Right on. Because his seeing stuff, it, it, I, I can't even comprehend what he sees. But that's when you talk about, like, this is becoming real. Is he strategic? It seems such a simple term to say, oh, yeah, well, what do I think of as strategic, right? Well, that's a strategic business move. No, no, it, you, the word strategic doesn't even fit. It doesn't even how, begin. To touch it, it doesn't even begin. Yeah. It, it just touches the surface of how unbelievably faceted it is. But I had to understand, okay, it's hard to make the choice to consider it pure joy. But if you truly believe that he's got it, and means that he's ahead of you, he's a shepherd, we recognize his voice, he is strategic, all of these things are being worked together. Even the things that seemed accidental, seem, even the things that seem like they are not orchestrated, are all redeemed for the purposes of exposing the truth. And that's what has been happening. But what's beautiful about that is th this is now becoming it's now becoming clear. The, the the pressure is still on, but there's it's almost like how can someone have peace in the midst of torture? Yeah. Right. And you think about what's the worst possible thing? Let's pull your fingernails out, let's cut off your extremities. What is that? Can you? Yeah, he's got that too. And I'm like, that's hard to imagine. But what's interesting about it is he showed me, it's really weird. He used the Bible yeah. to remind me of things. And what's amazing about it is he used the scriptures to help me understand, but it was actually for me in the moment, not academically in retrospect. Right. It's like, no, right. this is really useful. I've talked about these things over and over again. Now you're going to see these things into practice. But I think that the commentary is around this idea that is essentially the spirit of the church that that there is a i mean in the last 200 years there's been this move towards um what dispensationalism right this yeah. I, that there's no there is no these things are over that the living jesus does not speak there are no revelations there are no you can't talk to him he's dead and here I am seeing, actually, no, he's very much alive and very much has it all still under control. And what's amazing to me is like, I don't know that I would have, I have attributed to him that he cares about all of it at once. Yes. And at all players in all situations, but for a purpose that has a general trajectory, which is I'm exposing the truth of this. And what is the benefit of that? Okay, I'm going to solve this problem. I'm going to advance this ball, but in the process, you're going to understand the terms of relationships. You're going to understand the pitfalls. You're going to see things through this pain that will be helpful for you in the future. But it is the consistency is that it is a constant redemption. Yes. It, because the truth redeems these things. And they're, it's not that they're not painful because they are painful. And it's not like it makes you numb to it. It's almost that it puts it in its proper place. Yes. So that's a lot to say. But Steve, this is a, it's a different, I mean, I've had a lot of ahas with you. This is probably, probably at the, at the core, the most fundamental because it's, it's applicable to like everything. Like this is it. You either believe that I'm sovereign over all of this and I've got it or you don't. And otherwise you're just playing. We're just playing a game. And I think that that's a lot of what we see in, in cultural Christianity is that we, you know, you have a form of godliness, but you deny its power. Why? You say that I've got it, but you're freaked out. You're, you're, you're consumed by it. 
And, you know, I know it says consider it pure joy, but I don't do that. And that is really what somewhat convicting, but it's also showing me how it, the framework works. And that's, I mean, it's priceless. I, I don't even know what to say. Well, you're saying plenty and it's, it is fun to, to hear, to hear you share these, these things, because there are so many things we've talked about in the, you know, over the course of these streams and, and personally together that are coming to coming to a head and, and moving into their place of reality. The lazy Susan. Well, what precipitated the lazy Susan was, okay, Matt, this is where you practice yeah. stepping outside of this thing. Remember we were talking about that? And this is where yeah. you step outside of it and you start looking from the micro of the money to looking at this, At I think we described it as this the broader spiritual landscape. And then saying, okay, Jesus, how do you see that? Well, what are you doing when you say that? You're getting out from underneath this earthbound, earthly kind of perspective that's very narrow to actually taking him up on his invitation to sit with him to take a look at it. Yeah. Well, that's what you're doing. Now, the, the words that introduce that idea is to sit with Christ in heavenly places but that's just a concept that if you're not careful will obligate you to something that you've never experienced so you start pretending well jesus isn't in the pretend business yeah he's in the reality business he's in the truth business as a matter of fact once again if you look at the language that he had the new testament written in our word truth actually has has a parallel meaning of reality. You know, it reality is truth and truth is reality. Boy, when you take a look at that, it is fascinating that okay, now you get a whole different picture because what is all what can also be the truth and what is the truth? Ah, it's character quality. You know, it's because you have two facts that are two events, exactly the same thing happening. Case in point, that plate was falling. And there were money all around that plate as it was drifting through the air currents and getting ready to crash on the ground. Well, what produces that money? Human beings. They are the wealth producers. Well, that thing was happening. That single event was happening. That outcome was going to occur. What was the difference? Your perspective and anticipation of what was going to happen and Jesus's perspective of what was going to happen. Your conclusion was that it was going to crash to the ground and, you know, shatter into a billion pieces. That it was going to fall apart. Jesus's perspective was, no, it's falling into place. Same event. Yep. Two entirely different perspectives. One is upside down, one is right side up. And he will allow us to take and choose whichever perspective we want. That's the liberty that comes to the Elohim man. He is free to choose. And you know what's amazing is we, we can choose to come to him. Yes. So I was talking to you on the phone and my son was sitting in the passenger seat and we got done with our call and i had told him that because i was telling you about this he said it's not falling apart it's falling in place and gage goes after i got off the phone with you he goes like how do you know that was jesus how do you know that he said that great question it, well, yeah because i've asked you the same exact one that was one of my first questions to you i was like yep. hey son yep. you're asking the right question here yep. yep and i said 
I, and I, and it's weird how these things come to you, right? Cause here I am like, now I'm telling my son about this, right? This is the expanse of this. And it, I said to him, I said, when you want to talk to me, do you go talk to the dog? And he's like, ha 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 dad. Right. I'm like, you don't, right? When you want to talk to me, you don't go talk to the dog. And it, it sounds dumb, but it's true. Yes. And I said, so the question is this, how do I know that it's Jesus? Because I came to him to ask him. I didn't just, in my mind, make up some words and ideas. No, I came to him with an intent of hearing from him. So in our natural world, you'd walk into the living room and you'd come sit down next to me and ask me a question. You wouldn't go, oh, dad's over there. I'm going to go talk to the dog about this and hope he hears. Yeah. And it was really actually kind of cool. I said, well, what is your intent? What do you want? And I and it helped me realize what was I doing? And so I woke up at 237 and I'm under, you know, and I literally was like, it's almost like in all of this, he wanted me to see I needed everything to be. It's almost like he needed me to be aware of my lack of strength. Right, needed to be in this position of, I got nothing. Yeah. So okay, you're you're open to listening. But I didn't have a list of things that I needed because I didn't know how to solve the problem. And so I'm coming to him, and I feel like that's this idea of a contrite heart. What does it mean to really truly be like? And you think about it. What's the cycles of the stories of the Israelites? Things get good, and they're like, yeah, we got everything. And then things go to hell in a handbasket, and they're like, oh, my gosh, sackcloth and ashes. We need to come back to you. And I find the same cycles in my own life, right? And then you think about it. It's like, careful what you wish for. Yeah. You know, because yeah. in some respects, in this wanting state, we, we rely on him. But I almost feel like all he's saying is, I'm here and available. And... If you come to me, what you're going to find is I'm going to reveal to you how how strategic and big and all this. And, it, and it's amazing to me that here we are building the super AI. And we have him right here. And we've had him all along. And men throughout history have gone to him and came to him. And it's not what you think it is, right? You think you want the secret cheat code. And what he's saying is, no, you you will get the truth from me. And that's actually what you need. And I think that, that once you kind of realize that, well, the, the constructs of my own hands are pale in comparison to what he's capable of doing. So why don't I just go there first? And I feel like that's what I see you doing. You're like, well, why do I not get worked up about everything? Because I've learned that it doesn't do any damn good. <laughs> and so true. I've learned he's that. He's got it. <laughs> he's got it. And it's... And I'm not saying everything is rosy and I'm not, you know, anxious about it. And I don't have challenges, but what it does is it puts it into a certain place. And I'm going to tell you, Steve, over this last month, I mean, the spirits, you know, this started out with, uh, with Mike Ostell saying, Hey, the closer you get to him, the closer you're going to see this. Well, that's what I've been seeing. And I literally had to say, you have no standing here. Go away. Yeah. I mean, I literally in the past, I'm like, well, yeah, because I wasn't really particularly effective. There's no need to really take me out because I'm already out. And it's like you get into the game like this, and it's like I got to put a little bit more pressure on this. And it's almost like now there's an actual real decision to be made and a certain amount of courage that comes into this of standing on this. Because, you know, what's funny is we talked about faith, and I'm, I'm like tying everything we talked about together into one thing. And you said faith is not something you have. It's something that you're given. Yeah. And that's another big piece of this is what I saw was, no, he gave me the faith. Yeah, It came with it. Why? Because I had nothing when I entered. Yeah. And I said, how do you see this? Okay, let's get this away from you, put it in its proper place. Now let me show you what I'm doing with this. And now I understand. Why would I consider it pure joy when facing troubles of many kinds? Because the purposes of troubles of many kinds is actually to expose the truth, but it works on... 80 different levels, not just the one that you're thinking it is. But do you want to live this way, right? And you think about it, well, there's where the piece of transact, you know, transcends all understanding. That's where the provision is because he doesn't give as the world gives. And so what I've done is I've tried to make Jesus give me like the world gives. 
And he's like, I don't give as the world gives. Yeah. And it's like, oh, okay. So I need to understand that this is the framework. This is how you operate. And of course, what do I see in you, Steve? I see someone who has peace that transcends all understanding. And I'm like, okay, I want to live like that. But what's so great about it is it's accessible to anyone. Anyone. Absolutely. Yep. All of us. Yeah. But this is way, like, I hope people understand, like, what I'm communicating here, this isn't like a program. This is like, th this is the framework. And it's almost as if everything that we've talked about, from the collapsing of the waveform to Jesus is alive and he speaks, it's all the same. It's yeah. his construct that we find ourselves in the midst of. And he's not going to get in the way of our free freedom to choose. But he's so willing and available if we're willing to approach him. And, and it's, there's it's so much common. benefit to doing it. Oh, yeah. It's his cosmos. Right. There you go. That's a good one. For God so loved his cosmos. Yeah. For God so loved the way he built this thing. All yeah. of it. All of it. Every bit of it. See? And it's self-cleansing. It, I mean... It's it, it is marvelous. I mean, you want to you want to go another level with Please. with, with uh, now. Let's get this into the into the nitty gritty. Just use the eyedropper for me, please. <laughs> use the right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Carter has learned to uh, to appreciate the eyedropper as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, and probably like all of us, right? I was offended when he showed the eye, the drop, not just the eyedropper, but the drop. Yeah. <laughs> I was offended until I experienced firsthand by personal experience <laughs> the the drop. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We in the upside down world, we think in terms of the project. That's the number one thing for us is the project. Not so in the right side up world. The project is nothing until the wealth producers get engaged. Because the project is just a concept. The Hebrew writer says the that which is intangible became tangible. What? Through what God spoke. You know, the... By faith, we understand. Well, what does that mean? Apart from faith, we can't understand. Huh. Can't do it. Okay, then first question is, Jesus, what is faith? Well, Steve, it's not what you have been told it is. You've been told it's your form of believing. Yeah. And then if you unpack that even further, it is the belief system that you've adopted as truth. And then if you go a little bit further and see, he keeps going on layers. And in those layers, what do we see? Oh, faith is really all about us. It's what we believe. It's all on us. No, no. You cannot understand a single thing apart from my faith. You can surmise, you can, you know, create concepts, but you really can't can't understand. So by faith, we understand when he takes his, when he speaks to us, in that speaking is what we've called before, is this little packet of power called faith that enables and brings together virtually everything that he says to do. So it's moving from the intangible, just like what we see with the concept, I mean, excuse me, with the creation the concept is that, that began with a concept. So the same thing happens with the project. It's just a concept until what happens, until Jesus speaks it. And then what does he speak? What does he then end up doing? Okay. He then has he mobilizes his wealth producers to actually create it. Oh, wow. Well, who was the wealth producer back then? Oh, I think that was called the word, the logos. And who was the Logos? The Logos came out of the Father. And what did he do? He created. So that everything is created, was created by him. Apart from him, nothing is created that has been created. So now for us, we think in terms of the importance of the project. Yeah. Not so in his world. In his world, 
It's the wealth producers. So now how does that apply to the situation you just went through? Well, let's look at a little parable again. There's this parable about a guy who owns a field. And so he's got some work that needs to be done. So he goes into the marketplace and he sees all these people hanging around, all these guys. And he says, hey, man, why are you just hanging around here? Ah, we don't have any work. Nobody's coming here to offer us work. He says, hey, I'll offer you some work. Okay. I tell you what, if you go work in my, in my vineyard, I'll pay you a denarii for the day. They said, cool, man. That is awesome. Compared to what I had, that's <laughs> a bonanza. Because yep. I went from zero to a bunch. So he goes, and we know the story. Then he goes into the marketplace again. At, and the first group, he worked with them on the basis of an agreement of a transaction based on a quantifiable amount in exchange for the labor that they provided, a denarii. Each group after that, the mechanism of currency was his word. I will pay you what is right at the end of the day. And they said, oh, okay, what is there? There, is a trans there was a transition from the quantifiable amount to the unquantifiable goodness of what is right. Well, at the end of the day, you know the story. Hey, he said, hey, let's have the, let's have, beginning with the last, let's bring them up and I'll pay them. Now, why in the world did you do that? If you wanted to avoid a controversy, why didn't you just bring the first boys up? Wow, what did, okay, dude, you're wrecking my head already. All right. And so I paid him a denarii. And the next group who came in at three, a denarii. And the next group that came in, a denarii. And finally, the guys that worked all day long bore the, the heat of the day. He paid them the denarii. And they got pissed. The very thing that they were excited about in the beginning, when he gave them what they asked for in the quantifiable amount, they end up being pissed. I hope that language is okay in this audience, right? In Europe, of our UK guy, that means getting drunk. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. <laughs> right. So they were upset, right? Yeah. And then he says to them some really profound things. He said, why are you upset? Are you upset because I am generous? Did I not give you what we agreed? If I did, why are you upset? Are you upset because I am generous? And then he asked this profound question that Hobby Lobby would have been wise to have adopted back in their challenge. Can I not do what I wish with what is my own. Now think about that for a minute. That is exactly what the prodigal's father did. Mm -hmm. He viewed his financial resources as of lesser value than the generosity that flowed out of him toward his son once his son experienced firsthand what life had to offer apart from the father. Now, why am I sharing, sharing this? Because in your world and in your project, it's not the project. It's not the new economic order. It's not crypto. It's not decentralized. It's not even finance. It's the wealth producers who are going to be involved in materializing that project. And there will be some who will deal with you only on the basis of a quantifiable exchange of resource. I will provide you the resource of my labor in exchange for a fixed amount of dollars or whatever in return. Well, 
they have a role to play in the vineyard. But they have chosen their mechanism of exchange. They have set the terms of their relationship. Well, do you think that's important for you to know that? Yeah. Ah, gee whiz, Jesus, thank you for this little experience that is going to be profound, the legs of which are going to ripple through the lake of this project, like a rock being dropped in the center of it, that I would have never understood without the lack of money that I'm now beginning to see is a resource of revelation. Matt, that is beyond profound. Yep. When, because now you're getting into the nitty gritty of this thing. It's it not is. that they're bad guys or good guys. It's just that they have a different mechanism of engagement. Yeah. See? And you need to know what, well, what, that, and what's, what those are. What's funny is it's not like you haven't said this to me before. <laughs> right. But it just goes to show you. It's the practice of it. Yes. Right. And it's like. And it's I think it's like with any education. Yes. It is. It's like, okay, I can understand it, you know, the philosophical, I can understand, but it's really in the practice of it that you go, okay, now I understand how it works. Yes. And the patience, the patience of God with us is, it's overwhelming sometimes. And the, and the, and the grace that comes with that, it's like your patient. And of course, I guess that's the beauty of being able to see all angles in not having time as a constraint. And I appreciate that because I think one of the things that I've realized in all of this is that there's so many people in this upside down world that we've kind of, you know, as the world gives have real, have, have thought and believe that I'm alone and I have to get mine. Yeah. And in that process, and this is where the whole feeding of the 5,000 and the unlocking of generosity comes in is that it really feels like you're alone. And I felt very alone and yeah. I, it feels like it's going to shatter. Yeah. And it's like, if I don't do something, Steve, if I don't pull up myself out of my bootstraps or if I don't do this, I'm, I mean, I don't know what will happen. And it's, you get struck with fear. And it's interesting to think, what is this provision? Well, at the very core of it is, I will give you something different than the world gives. And when I give you that thing, that packet of faith, and you, you think about this, you know, people talk about in the new age world, they talk about manifesting, hmm. right? And what is the core of that? It's this idea that if I tell myself enough times, right, I speak to myself enough times and I make a choice and, and you know, there's, there's some very practical things about what do you want? Sure. And I was thinking about this as like, well, what did I want when I came to Jesus? I wanted his perspective. I didn't want his money. But it's like, that's where I needed you to be, because you don't realize that it's not, and, and you know, you think about Solomon's commentary around wisdom and what it actually is. Don't, don't ask for the riches. Yeah. You know, and what did I gain from it? Well, you gain a perspective. And what does that perspective do? but it enables this wealth producing creation. And I think that what's really interesting is without me, you can do nothing. Well, nothing of value. Yeah. I mean, I can, you know, I can chop a tree down. Now you could potentially say I can't even breathe or exist without him, but let's just assume I've got some choice to chop a tree down. But there's this difference. And I think it's really incredible is that if I were to go regularly, and sit with him in this high place and to say, all right, how do you see it? And if you, and it has to be built on this premise of Jesus is alive and he speaks. All right, well, how do you see it and what's next? Well, then you can know that if he's got it and you know that he's got it, that whatever he speaks will happen and you can take it to the bank. So rather than in your fantasy world of what could be, no, go to the source and ask what will be. Yes. Yes. And it's yes. like, what will be? I don't know what will be. You know what will be. What do you? And what, I, what I've found is that, you know, we talk about David fighting the lion and the bear. What you don't realize in all of this is he's known you since the beginning. 
And all of these things that seem disjointed or accidental actually fit into the story of what you will to do, you are to do. You've been trained. And you're like, yeah. hold on a second. I'm not afraid of this guy. I fought the lion and the bear. Well, did you? Or did he create these experiences in which he's tying all of this stuff together because he knew you would come to him at some point? And here I am like, oh, my gosh, I'm glad I'm coming to him here, bef you know, before I am literally hammered to a cross next to him. Yeah. I'm glad that I'm having this conversation now. And thank you, Steve, for helping me get to that place. And, and on one hand, you could say, I don't like how this is structured because it's not me centered. <laughs> <laughs> very true you know i don't yeah, like how yeah. this i was like i want my stuff and i want to like i want to be somebody i want to be a king you know yeah. and it's like well no that's not how it works but you know you think about what is possible now in that context is to say okay what if it was and i think that this is really kind of the whole plan of it all what if i did hold these thoughts captive you know, what does it really look like to say, all right, what do we got next? And that's what I see the practice you're saying is like, this has been that process of being all these things peeled back. Yes. And these things washed away to get to the simplicity of, all right, you got this. And I know you got this. What are we doing? Yeah. How can I be of service? What can I do? What do you want? What do you have next? Yeah. And to think that, you know, why would you spend your time spinning your wheels? And it's obviously not that anything that normal people would think would be a problem. But, you know, I, I, I constantly think about there was a, a family in our church who adopted a boy who was so severely disabled, like full on complex wheelchair, completely immobile, um, like colostomy bag, uh, like literally could not function oxygen, you know, all of these things that are broken. Right. And they adopted this child, like the, the most, you know, most people would say, not sure that we want to add that to the list and their testimony about the joy of this boy mm. and caring for this boy. And you're like, hold on. These, these people actually like sought out this challenge. Yeah. yeah. And what they would communicate was it's the greatest thing they've ever done yeah. because the perspective that it provided. Well, and then my buddy who had stage four colon cancer, and he just said to me, this is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I'm like, what? He's like, Matt, you're just, I'm just ahead of you in line. <laughs> and I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, it's the greatest thing that ever happened. I'm like, okay. I don't have that right perspective. But now that I see this and it's like, well, thank you that you would reveal this in something that's not the death of a child. Yeah. That's not something that is like literally just deep, deep, deep cuts of wounds. And so having that perspective, I'm really thankful for that. Has it been resolved to my satisfaction? No, it has not. Yeah. But I trust that. And this is really the ultimate piece of this is he's given me the faith, which manifests itself in a peace right that's what i have now i have peace that he's got it and that the things that need to be exposed will be exposed in me and in others and it's like okay well this is how you know the purity of this next step of creation right the wealth producers creating so hopefully i'm just trying to say back to people kind of how i see it in this tangible sense that it's very difficult to see these circumstances that are right in front of you because they're so close to your face yeah. that they're overwhelming. Yes. And for you to call when you did and for you to say that is exactly what I needed at the exact right moment. And then it just kept blossoming. Right. And it even continues to today. For example, I'm like, well, why was it a plate? And he said to me, it's transparent. Mm -hmm. He says, the money is going to be sitting on a transparent. I'm like, is that the blockchain? Yes, it's transparent. My money is not going to be hidden. My money is going to be exposed and accounted for in the light. Yeah. I'm like, well, I thought the plate was going to just break. I thought we were just here because this was a fragile thing as an example. No, 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 no. No, what's falling, what you think is falling apart is falling into place on this transparent 
substrate. I'm like, oh my gosh. So you're like, you're like, this isn't, this is like 5D chess. Yes. And I'm like, okay. And it's real to it. You know, it's real. It, it's very, and you know, what's funny is I said to you long ago that I, I told the Lord at the very beginning of this whole journey with him, I said, if you're not real power, if you're not real stuff, I'm not interested. And he made it clear to me. He was real. And then this is just reinforcement of it. It's like, you know what? In a way, you kind of have to experience this yourself. You know, we talk about all this stuff and it's like, hey, Jesus is alive and he speaks. You're either going to try him on for size or you're not. Just be ready, though. He is pure light. Well, and, and isn't that what we talked about a few, a uh, couple episodes ago? You know, it can be unner unnerving at first hanging with this being of pure light because uh, he never he never exits light, nor does he enter darkness. And so when you hang with him, guess what you get the benefit of? <laughs> what that light exposes. And, and by the way, Paul says this, makes this fascinating statement. Yeah, my life is, uh, is awesome. You know? So this is, so let me tell you this. You don't know this. This is lit. Lit has been he's been away for a while so mm. you you know kind of kind of went a bit dark in the bear market this and, and um, say, say that again spell lit yeah he, he goes by lit I, i'm not sure what his real name is i think i've known it at one point but he goes by L -I -T? Lit. Yeah, L yeah yeah okay so yeah so he has a channel called my life is awesome mm. and um that is definitely um um yeah. So anyway, he has a channel and totally positive, upbeat guy and he's back. And so I just wanted to say hello. It's good to see yeah. it to you. I know you saw that you did a, a stream with crypto coffee, which is really cool, but it's just great. You know, people that are in, he's been spreading love throughout this community and being really, you know, and he's had some really serious challenges in his life and we've mm -hmm. kind of, he's kind of lived those things out loud and he's a part of, this community of transparency. And so I just, um, it's good to see you. Welcome yeah. back. Yeah, Welcome absolutely. Back, man. Thanks for, thanks for stopping by. Absolutely. Anyway, sorry. I didn't want to interrupt that. I just wanted to say hello. No, no, that's. <laughs> Jesus says what we talked about a few episodes ago was this light thing, right? Yeah. And then, on the heels of that, we were talking about, you know, that, hey, if you, when you start hanging out with this guy, I mean, he's, he's light. And, and Paul makes this fascinating statement where he says, all things that are visible are light. And then Jesus talks about this strange dynamic of the eye is the window to the soul and whatever enters the eye. And then he says, Hey, if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So he starts talking about a dark light dynamic. And then Jesus says about, um, about the spirit of truth that he will disclose all things to you that are mine and all things that are mine are the father's because the father has given them to me. And then he says this, and he will reveal to you, he will disclose to you what is to come. Yeah. Well, Matt, you have just experienced that. Yep. See, so you have experienced all of those various things coming together, each, each in each sentence, each part in this thing we call the Bible, through various individuals. Jesus saying something, John saying something, you know, Paul saying something all around the same dynamic of light that is then going to reveal. And that light will either be this pure light or it'll be this tainted light, this light of darkness. How great is the darkness? Well, the upside down world lives in this dark light. And when you saw the plate beginning to go through its processes, what did the dark light say to you? It's going gonna, it's gonna to bust into a thousand pieces. It's going to, and oh man, when it does, and I'm, you never said this,
but this is almost universally. And what will people think about yeah. you when yeah. that happens? You're talking about Jesus and you are going to end up looking like a fool. It's turned, and that's the characteristic of dark light. It always turns it inward to us to condemn, to criticize, to do all of those things, to sever the relationship that we have with Jesus in that experience. And so you stepped outside the picture that Jesus gave you, specific and unique for you, was in the lazy Susan. Let's get some distance on this thing so we can see it for what it is. And Matt, here is now what my light looks like. This thing isn't falling apart. It's falling into place. And here is what is to come. You're about to pick your team. You need to know how I pick my team. Yep. Okay. And so that time is approaching. And money will be an outstanding light to reveal whether that how that person is relating to the light of money. Because it's going to be visible. Well, what did he tell you? It's going to be this plate is going to be transparent. The device is going to be transparent. So everybody can see all things that are visible are light. What kind of light are they going to see? The light of his kingdom, as opposed to what? The light of darkness. And he's telling you the things that are to come, which is you're getting close to picking your team. Well, man, how many sermons have I heard that told me that that's how it works? Like zero. Zero. How many books have I read that have told me that that's how it works? Zero. Zero. Who is the one who taught me how to do that? to where I understood through firsthand experience. Only one. Jesus. <laughs> hey, man, that's how it works. Yeah. And so this, so what dark light says is an absence of provision, no money. Jesus said, it's my full provision. You just need to see it from where I'm seeing. Come on up, take a look. I think you'll enjoy the view. And that's what you're doing. You know, what's funny is I think of the concept of unlocking a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, what does it mean to unlock? And I think about a lot of this is a constant unlocking in us. Yes. You know, what is bound up? What is locked away? And what does he unlock? And it's interesting because these things we would say are revelations. We would say that they're breakthroughs. We would say that they're ahas. But if you think about it, it's something that was hidden is now exposed for what it is. And that is the aha, right? It's the, yes. wow, you've revealed something to be true that has implications. Yes. And the implications of this is significant, right? You say, hey, choosing your team, whatever that may be, showing you what what will, will happen. And I think that, you know, it's funny, like throughout my journey, there's been glimpses of this. And, you know, and I wonder, you know, in this, it's like the, in this training program, right? It's <laughs> like, you know, you want to go to the next level, right? You're like, oh, I'm ready. And you're like, are you? Are you? And it's like, okay. And, and you know what I was thinking, you know, let's say you're somebody in the Marine Corps and you want to go into like special ops, right? And you know, you've seen the videos and you've heard about this thing, but you have not experienced it yet. And what you don't realize is the games that they play, right? Yeah. They, they lock you in a box for 48 hours or whatever it may be and the whole thing to break you. And, you know, what is this revelation that you have in that process? And that's man-made, right? But we can use that analogy of to say, you need to understand the separation between your yes what you think is possible and what is really possible and i feel like there's something happening here that's very much like that you are you think it's of benefit to be firmly grounded in this reality as you see it but what you don't see is what i see 
And that, you know, all of these things now are the indicators. You're like, oh, yeah, you did say the battle wasn't between flesh and blood. And you did say that, you know, there's a lot that is unseen and that we see it dimly. And, you know, that's, I think, the really interesting thing about this is that, you know, we talk about what does it mean to share the gospel? Well, if I kind of back out from that right now, all I really think that you can possibly do as a man is try to use limited words to encourage people that there's something really great that they could experience if they approach them themselves. Yeah. Right. That I can't, like, you can't hand to me what he's handed to you. Yeah. Like, you can hand to me encouragement. You can give me time. You can be bear burdens. You can do all these things. But once you have seen it, that that light, if you will, one, you don't have the words to describe it. You can't articulate. It's just, and it's designed perfectly for you. But I go, well, why? And 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 uh, here's my question for you: Was it always planned that this would be the time? Is this the timing of the revelation because of the what's coming next? Right, this fullness of time is that I've prepared you in advance, and now I see. Oh yeah, I fought the lion and the bear, and all these things are coming together, and it's like. Or is it like, you're really slow. <laughs> you're really a dummy. And I've been yelling at you through my word, through everything, and you still haven't gotten it through your thick skull, you punk. And I don't think that that's the answer. But it's almost like, is all of this actually coordinated in the fullness of time because of the time that is to come? What are your thoughts on that? Because sometimes I feel like, man, what a thick skull I've got. No, that's the... Um... That's that's in the vocabulary of our dark light concept in the upside down world. That's that's the way that is the discouragement yeah. that comes from the dark light that that allows you to see something. But when you see it, it really isn't reality. It's not the truth. Right. It is a perspective that is implanted through the words and the concepts that has no bearing in reality until we choose to accept it. Then it becomes our reality. So no, we're not dumb and thick and in, in our, you know, we are products in this context of what how we are choosing to live. And I just can't emphasize that in, enough, Matt. It's not it's not becoming a brilliant decision maker. It's learning to make one decision. Do I want to run solo? Or would I like to hook up with a partner who's pretty good at what he does? It's yeah. no more complicated than that. And then once from there, the rippling effect of that simple decision is, is literally mind-blowing. And you're describing it throughout this entire, yep. you know, episode. Um, well, and I, now that I think about, <clears throat> you know, what's, what's right in front of me now, it's my son, right? My son's sitting there going, did he really say that, Dad? <laughs> Hang on, I'm going to sneeze. Yeah. You sneeze, I'm going to close, close my shades. Okay, sounds good. The, the sun is being in a weird time. Yeah. In where, where our property is located. It's uh, So, you know, this is kind of actually, we can kind of open a new chapter in this story. You know, here you are, more experienced man, taking your time out for me. Right. I have a son. I have kids. Right. You have son, kids. You have all of these things. You're you're a, a grandpa as well. And. You know, here's my son asking these questions, you know, and I think about. I never had these type of conversations with my dad. He wouldn't have had context of any of this stuff. But it's such an interesting thing to think, you know, here we are talking on a stream. There's 17 people on this channel. There may be more on on Twitter and, and on uh, the other channel. Um, and people may, you know, watch this over again. But 
the questions that I had at the very beginning, I'm sure the questions that just like my son has, yeah. Hey, how do I know that it's him and all that? And so here's the interesting thing. So I wrestled with this when I first met you, right? You're like, well, just listen to him. And I'm like, well, how do I know it's him? Right. Which is, I think the common question, like most yeah. people ask, I mean, I remember talking to Cadium and he's like, how do you know it's him? And I'm like, and of course, you know, he gives you these analogies. Here's the thing that's interesting, Steve. And I think that this, this may be helpful to other people who might be wanting to try this on for size mm -hmm. and tell me, like, help me explain this. When I went to him, he gives me, he gives me personally, and I think that this is custom designed for us and it may be different for different people, but he gave me a picture first and then gave me words. That's how it worked this time for me. Yeah. I'm not saying he's not going to be audible and go, you know, you know, and speak from the mountaintop, but it's been pretty consistent that there's always been a, and maybe that's just how he works with me and the temperament and all this to say, I know you understand these analogies, but I'm going to give you a word picture that has a lot of, a lot of things packed into it. And I'm going to give you a statement as well. And the fact that it's really, it's really interesting for me you know, you would say, hey, you can have this conversation at all times. You could have it right now. I feel like it's been really helpful to not have a lot of noise around me yeah. when these things have happened, right? Shower, strangely, you know, middle of the night, no, you know, no distractions, early morning. What do you... You know, I, I know that there's probably this scenario where like, hey, you can talk to me anytime. I'm not limited to these, you know, hours of operation. But what should someone expect? Because I almost feel like you can't say, well, this is how he does it. And he's going to do the same thing for me as he does for you. No, it, it seems like it's custom made for you. And it could take on a lot of different, at different times, be different approaches how do you explain that? Because I think a lot of people, I think it's hard to imagine. Really? Like my son is saying, Steve, do you, does Jesus really speak to you? How does he do that? Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people have that question. Yeah, they do. I mean, I had it, you know, we all do. And but what I would offer is part, part of that is because we are, we are approaching it from an, from a position of full experience now. I mean, your son is not listening to this stream. You know, there, there probably aren't many 10 or 12 year olds listening right. to this stream, let alone two or three year olds, let alone six month olds. <laughs> you see where I'm going with that? Yeah. yeah we, totally. are, we are fully grown adults who have our faculties trained over for seeing and hearing and speaking over many, many years, sometimes decades and decades. Me and Katie have been doing this for, you know, about seven decades. You know, we're pretty well schooled in how, how to see, how to hear, how to speak. And so we inject that mature experience into our beginning point with Jesus. All right. So what are we doing? We are injecting into a brand new experience, the full maturity of a capability developed over decades. And it, and the implication of that is that we want it to happen exactly the same way at that same level. Yep. So we use words like audible. We look with astonishment. You mean Jesus actually talks to you? Right. You know, oh, is it even possible? Does God, ah, oh, God doesn't talk to you. Look at this wacko. He thinks God talks to him. Right. You know, all of those very, all those various things. So, okay. So the first thing is that isn't how it works. Mm. Hey, once again, you don't bring the baby home from the hospital and say, okay, Here's the encyclopedia. Read me the first four chapters and let's see what your comprehensive skills are. No, we don't do that. We start from a very basic point 
with the idea of elevating the child from where their beginning point is of having no experience or skill set developed, even though the capability is there, to eventually bringing them along to where they can have a mature means of not only speaking, seeing, and hearing, but also comprehending the very things they speak, hear, and say. Okay? It's time. Yeah. So, first of all, let's be reasonable about this a little bit. Accept your starting point. Yeah. You know, this is one of the uh, one of the prophets. I can't remember his name right off the bat. Is Jehovah said to him, "Do not despise the day of small beginnings." Ah, yes. See, the kingdom of God is like a man sowing seed. When that seed is sown, it doesn't show up as the full mature fruit the next 15 minutes. Yeah. It has to go through a process that is prescribed and defined within the construct of my kingdom. Accept that. What happens when you try to rush the seed in its growth? You don't get the produce. You want the produce? Relax a little bit. And Jesus says certain things like, th like this. If you want to enter my kingdom, you have to enter as a little child. Well, that word is infant. you got to enter as an infant. So there is a transferring of from obligation to hear to understanding we have the capability of hearing, but then transferring the responsibility to the one who knows how to hear and speak and see to train us properly in the proper time. I mean, think about this, Matt. Look, at we met a year ago last September. Uh -huh. We're not a full 18 months into this thing. Tell me the amount of growth that you have had in that 18 months in this area. Yeah, it's just, it's like nitrous oxide has been injected into the cylinders. Right? Yeah. And what's happening? Because we're not rushing it. You're, you're doing your part. Nobody has a chance. Nobody has authority to speak to me, but Jesus alone. Yep. Yeah, I know you're going to be running off the mouth, but you have no standing here. So the moment I recognize it's you, it's going to be over. Have you had that experience? Oh, yeah. Of oh, saying yeah. it's over? What yeah. happened when you said it's done? It was gone. It was gone. Was that some theoretical thing? No, it like fleed from me. Yes. Exactly what James 4, 7 says. And it will flee from you seeking safety. Why? Because you're beginning to enter the realm of intolerable risk. They cannot tolerate. The powers of darkness cannot tolerate a single man, a single woman, venturing into the forbidden area of learning to listen to Jesus. So, I'm going to say it again. Your starting point is simply saying, Jesus, would you teach me how to hear your voice and how to live with you every day in every moment in everything that I do? Will you simply teach me how to hear your voice and to live with you? Once you do that, and it's the real deal, then my input is relax. It's not a formula. Right. It is a relationship, just like you didn't incorporate a formula for those of you who, had, who brought a baby home from the hospital. You didn't sit there with a little flow chart and say, okay, we start here. Then if we do this and we go here, you know, you, you didn't do that. No. It's the same kind of thing. So that might be a little, a little lengthy answer, but that kind of brings a lot of the elements together hey, just be satisfied with being an infant in the kingdom and let the one who knows how to do this teach you how to do it right. Yeah. Well, and, and you've said this many times and you've given many examples of this is 
are you interested? Yeah. There's that basic thing. And I think that that's so why I've always said that this is the access is refreshing, right? You've made Jesus more accessible to me. Mm. Well, isn't that kind of what he's like, have the, them come to me. Yeah. Right. And you think about this idea of like, I always remember your story about being six years old and the pastor saying, Hey, I want to introduce you to Jesus. They're like, where's he at? <laughs> yeah, I I'm love in. that so much. <laughs> right. But it's the same kind of thing. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in knowing. And, and I think the thing here for me to, you know, cause I, I came to process this stuff as an adult, right? I was 28 yeah. years old when I really was like, Hey, like, you know, you're going to have to either fish or cut bait here, dude. Like you're going to be real or you're not. Yes. I need you to be real. That'd be really, really nice. Um, but it's, um, that's the incredible part about all this. It's, it's hard to imagine, but here we are coming into an interesting time, Steve. Like when I grew up in, you know, seventies, eighties, right. That was kind of my seventies, eighties, nineties, if you will. Um, you know, there was kind of, you know, a lot of things weren't exposed, yeah. right? We didn't have a 24-hour news cycle. You know, the things that we were kind of worried about were kind of local. Um, you know, really, really only looked at network television. Um, you know, video games kind of started, but it was Pong. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we played in the woods a lot. Um, it was simpler times. You know, and here we are, and I think that as things, as we have access to more of this and, you know, look at the World Economic Forum, right? Maybe we can transition to the like today stuff. The World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab and his band of elites are meeting and their number one concern is misinformation and disinformation. And what's amazing is you said to, and we've talked about this many times, that once you see it, you can't unsee it. Yeah. And all you have to do is listen to it and it will reveal itself. Yes. Okay. And you know, I'm like, well, how does that work? Now I understand how that works. Yeah. And so what do they do? Their number one priority is to keep you from seeing the truth. Their number one priority is they're saying this misinformation, disinformation, which is literally, in my opinion, we don't want you to actually know what's really going on. So our agenda is one of censorship. Yeah. We want to control the narrative. And you think about this. What is freedom? What is pure light? If not probable truth. Yes. And, you know, and I think about guys like, um, I admire Tucker Carlson because he's like, well, why can't we just ask any question? Why can't we probe it to the very, very depths of it? Why aren't we asking these questions? Why is anything off limits? And what's really neat about that is that's actually reflective of Jesus. Like, he's okay. You can ask him anything. Yeah. And I think that that's the thing that's really interesting about this is it's shifted from requests to questions. And I think there's something really big about that. But When you see, and I'm not just trying to say that, you know, Klaus Schwab is the devil. I'm saying there is a group of people who have gone their own way. And when you think about the simplicity of this is you said, do you want to do it on your own or you want to do it with the guy who made it all? Right. And you, you think about that. Well, that's kind of the thing that he preserved. You can go your own way. But it also seems, Steve, like there are this, the spirits of darkness that don't have authority will try to get your authority and try to essentially convince you and potentially offer you things just like when Satan tempted Jesus and said, Hey, you can have all of this. And he's like, Nope. He resisted that, right? That temptation of no, I, no, you know, man does not live on bread alone, but all of the promises that were given, it seems like Jesus modeling that behavior to say no. And, and now I understand like why, why is the first commandment the first commandment? It makes 100% why it's number one. You yeah. should have no gods before me. Why? Because that's what you're going to find in this world, yeah. that there are so many things that are going to try to be gods before me. And what do we see? Yeah. We see people across the world who, in a way, I was my own god. It could be a number of things. I could say it's money. I could say it's relationships. I could say it's 
you know, whatever, insert drugs, insert whatever. But then there's also the spiritual side of things that you realize that, hold on, the whole idea of this is to make you ineffective and not be in the game. But to think that there are those who have aligned themselves with these forces and had been given power and have participated in that scarcity model and in that left-hand side of the slide and in that um, scarcity thing and have participated with it. And you, you know, and I think a lot of times they don't realize or recognize that they are agents of that darkness. So I feel like the implications of all this, you know, when I reflect on the 80s and 90s, and now I look at today, the timing of this is there's a role that we play. And the more and more I think about the money falling onto the plate, it's not about the money at all. No. It's not about the money at all. And that actually there are so many elements that are kingdom focused. So for example, what is, if I said the kingdom is a place of generosity and abundance, and let's say those things are true. And the in the left-hand side or the upside on world is one of scarcity and enslavement. It's one of control and, and power. It's not one of freedom and it's not one of rest and it's not one of peace and it's not one of abundance and if you think about this very binary that this is a choice that we make of who we will follow and now it makes sense to me well we could make a decision and things change that's a, this is like huge huge implications of that and i think about well what's our role you know, two years ago when I started this channel, I'm like, I was not doing this before, Steve. Like, this <laughs> yeah. is new. Yeah. And I think about it, and I'm like, well, there's there's 10,000 people subscribed. And, okay, that's a decent amount of people. There's probably, you know, there's only 15 on this one particular stream. But everyone I talked to, I had a, I brought a guy on DIY investing. This kid is 26 years old. He was in juvenile detention. He, you know, was snatched out of the fire. And he's like, yeah. I, and I didn't talk to him about anything related to faith or anything. He's like, yep. You know, I prayed and prayed to Jesus and I didn't really believe in him, but I got into psychedelics and I saw, um, I saw the demonic. I, I came face to face with the demonic and I, and I literally ran the other way and I ran to Jesus. And it's like, and I'm like, this kid's 26 years old. We didn't like, we're on a crypto channel. <laughs> And we're talking, like, why is this all going to this? And what I've found is every time we ask those questions and we're not just, like, focused on the money, and that's what happens in these interviews. It's like, oh, yeah, just, hey, what are you doing? What, how does this work for you? And then next thing you know, it's like, no, there's a purpose in all this. And yeah. I see that he's using the money to empower and lift up his man Right. And it's like preparing for this time. Yeah. But the implications aren't just, oh, you're going to be rich. No, no, no. The richness is not financial. The richness is what beyond you can possibly imagine. And I think about this like, is Jesus know of infinite energy? Does he know of infinite healing? Does he know of infinite existence? Does he know of eternity? Does he know of, you know, provision? All, yes, all of the above. Are we living in it? No. Is Ooh. something amiss? Yes. Yep. Well, what does it take? And it, what is amazing to me is that that it, it, it resides and rests in a decision that we each make yeah. rather than some event that might happen. Oh, Jesus is returning. He'll make it all right. No, no, no. What's he doing in you? Yeah. Like you actually are a part of his kingdom coming. And partly because I think we're an extension of the Father, just like the Son was. Yeah. Right? We're just an extension of Him. Anyway, I, I just went on to like 50 different topics there. but Well, yeah. it's, it, it is, it's fun, though, because you're, yeah. you know, if we had a more structured kind of stream, that <laughs> might that might have been, you know, going off the rails. But... <laughs> that's not the way that's not the way this particular conversation yeah. goes. It is conversation. Yeah. And the way that that we're talking together 
I know you are having more so, but I have those same conversations with Jesus where I go totally off the rails, <laughs> you know, and I'm going all over the place. And not one time have I ever experienced him being disinterested in what I had to say, because every single bit of it is connected to the core reality of what is true. I'm beginning to discover what is true. And sometimes that's really clear and I can state it precisely. Sometimes it's foggy and I've got to say about a 10,000 words just to try to get it out in the various concepts. Sometimes it's just about being quiet and, and just thinking about it. And they're all acceptable in the, because this is not a mechanical engagement. It is a relationship between living beings. Huh. And it's very, very fluid. When I first started this whole thing about hearing from God, I wanted to, I wanted to create a flow chart. Yeah. You know, I wanted to create a mechanism. In fact, I've taught for years. There are certain friends who have been with me way back in the early 80s when I, you know, when I put together these teaching seminars called Hearing from God. And man, that was really great stuff, but I was simply describing what my own experience was, which there wasn't anybody talking that way back then. Yeah. Um, and I tried to make it a mechanical process and or take it to a mechanical process. And once I started going in that direction, Jesus shut it down. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not where we're going. That's not what this is about. You know, once you do that, you put it in control of other people and they will, in all good intention, they will pervert it because they don't know how to teach another person how to hear my voice. Yep. See, I'm the only one who knows how they're wired. I'm the only one who knows when to inject myself into that situation and speak a little word into their ear in a half a sentence, or like in Mike's case, one compound sentence that, you know, He's going, wow, that's okay. I like that. And out of a compound sentence, just blew this thing up. We get on the get on the phone together. And two page two pages of notes later, he's going, wow, all out of a compound sentence. Well, I don't know how to do that. But Jesus knows how to do that. Yeah. You know, and that, you know, and we've said it many, many times. And and by the way. Learning how to do this is really essential. You know, in sports, they have a term is and we've talked about it occasionally on here, especially in the early, early episodes that you're only as good as your fundamentals. Well, that's what's happening. Your fundamentals are being not only established, but refined. So that you, oh, wow, it really is true. It's just not a concept that I can say, you know, guys. You've said your piece, we'll see you. Well, wait till you tell them to produce. Wait till this reality that Jesus has got it and you're starting to get it and the intruder comes in and starts, you know, brandishing all kinds of stuff and you say, okay, show me what you got. And watch what happens to them. Now, you're not going to tell somebody who just got started day yeah. before yesterday to do that. But in a couple of years, you might introduce that concept to them. Okay? Just like what's happening, you know, with what's happening with you. You're actually learning how this works, not from a theoretical or, or a philosophical standpoint. But hey, man, this, this is the real deal. That's what we're longing for on the planet. Matt, is the planet, if you're listening to them, if you're listening to the people, they're screaming out, will somebody please just tell me the truth? Yep. 
will you please just tell me the truth? Well, guess what? This is what the truth looks like. Hmm. It hasn't, but it doesn't resemble anything of what a person thinks. Because it's not a, a series of factual statements. It is a person. You want the truth? Go to the guy who's the truth. And um, we say it every week. You know, it's you're not going to be disappointed if you're really interested. Yep. And you're sharing that today. Yeah. I mean, how many, hey, what would have taken you to come up with the story that you talked about? Well, you can. You yeah. can. No. It's like, I don't have the horsepower to make that stuff up. No. You know? Yeah. It's a, the, it's a really delicate mystery that is, you know, it's real. And I think that that's, you know, you think about this testimony, you know, what is the testimony, right? And, and I, I think about how do people, how do people come to it? Cause there is a certain element of this that, you know, as we partner with them, that we have a responsibility, yeah. you know, this whole idea of being kind of prepared in season and out of season kind of thing. It's not what I've been taught. No, no. You know, it's not what I've been taught that it is, you know, and that's where I feel like this idea of we've got to be preaching salvation. Right. And I, I think I brought up this last time is that it feels like, We've, conf we've confused onboarding with the truth of the gospel. Right? Yeah. We, we've basically said, no, no, it's this mechanistic thing, and that's all that it is. And it's actually, no, it's like, um, it's like, you know, when we teaching people about crypto, right? Okay, well, what's it like? Well, it's kind of like the, the kind of like the financial system that we're in right now. What, what, what do you mean? Well, do you have a bank account? Yeah. Does it have a number? Yeah. I mean, do you deposit money? Yeah. Do you ever look at the money? Uh, yeah, I guess I've looked at money. What's on the money? There are numbers on the money. Why are the numbers on the money? Okay. What happens when you put that money in the bank? What do they do? Well, they record it. Well, where does it, where do they record it? Oh, and how do they know it's yours? Okay. Right. And then you start getting into this and you're like, well, what's it like? And I feel like in a way, the the teaching that that we see that the the Jesus taught, you know, the way in which we teach effectively is to draw analogies and say, hey, this is what it's like. It's very similar to this. But let's not confuse the knowledge of it for the implications of it. And I feel yeah. like that's what we've kind of done is we've said we want to make this nice and tidy to onboard. But I think what I, I saw as a kid, why I thought it was all hokey, you know, I thought this whole Christian thing was hokey because you know what? The way it's presented, it is. Because it's a form of godliness that denies its power. It doesn't have, you know, and I was thinking about this, you know, I came, I came to Dallas in 2000. And, you know, it was September 10th of 2000 when I had this like massive aha, like weight lifted off me. And I'm like, okay, this is real. But prior to that, you know, I was kind of like going my own way. And, you know, there's a lot of weird people that are into this Christian stuff, right? Fine, fine. If it works for them, great. It doesn't work for me. Because I didn't, you know, I didn't re re recognize it for what it is. And, but it's also the way that it was presented. And because it felt like it lacked power, it lacked any substance. And what I think is really fascinating about this is, I came into this kind of Bible church world. And in Dallas, if you know that area, and I know you do, there's this whole, you know, group of people that come out of Dallas seminary. Yeah. And, you know, when you're, when you're kind of educated a certain way, you assume that that's the truth. And what is that theology? It's one that says, you know, everything is closed. Everything is over. We're in this new, you know, we're in this new, you know, a uh, period of time and it really is promoted. And I think that this is the challenge that you'd have. If you said to them, I think one of the toughest questions that you'd have to ask people in that, in that um, kind of evangelical space is, is Jesus alive? And you might have to ask it like 30,000 times over and over and over again. Do you believe that he is alive? 
And because I, I would say the majority of this theology is built on the back of historic Jesus and no new revelation, no, no, you know, it's a, it's a fake relationship because he's not speaking anymore because there are no gifts anymore. And of course, this is what's so neat about this is this fits right in the middle because I've seen both sides of this. I've seen the God is dead side of it and Jesus is dead and he was a good guy. And I saw the other side, which is like, I'm making up stuff that God's saying, I've got a word for you. And what's really amazing about that is it's bastardized on both ends of the spectrum. On one end, it's like he's dead. And on the other hand, it's like, like he won't shut up. And he's telling me everything about you. And so then I, I meet you and I go, I can't even imagine. Because you've never said this to me. You never said to me, hey, Matt, Jesus talked to me and he told me what you need to do. And let me tell you what that word is, my friend. And it's almost like it's almost like I feel like that's the last thing you would ever say to me because you understand how it works. Yeah. He doesn't, he speaks to people who are interested in hearing from him. He doesn't now. I think are there insights? Have you been very helpful in giving me some perspective? You've asked me questions like, hey, are you open to an alternative view of this? because of your experience, but you've never said to me, the Lord Jesus spoke to me about you, Matt, and he said this about you. And that to me is wrong too. Yeah, It feels wrong. And I'm not sure that I got it right, but it's like, I'm not saying that there's not prophetic people, but it's almost like a cultural prophetess, right? The prophet and the prophetess and they're, they're, you know, they're, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's weird. And then on the other end, it's like, well, we're all alone here and mm -hmm. Jesus is dead and we're on our own. And it's like, I'm so, I'm so thankful because I, I literally read the scriptures. And I'm like, what happened to this guy? He was really active and he was like involved in a lot of things and had a lot of things to say. Where's this guy? Anyway, I digress. <laughs> hey, it's, it's really hard to, to put um, Jesus in a box, <laughs> which is what we try to do. Um, but just because we have experienced him in one way doesn't mean that's the only way or the primary way that he that he operates. I mean, yeah. he, he is, like I said earlier, you know, it, it's very fluid. So sometimes, and I have had him say, okay, Steve, go talk to somebody. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is what I'm saying, and they need to pay attention to this. Uh, I remember one time the Lord told me to go tell a guy he was going to be fired from the church as a pastor, that Jesus was actually, you know, your time at this church is over. Start making plans to go, you know, to go on the next leg. And this particular individual is supposed to follow behind you not realizing, I mean, I didn't even have any clue about how that church system worked. And, you know, and I expected him to jump across the table with a right cross and, you know, who are you? And he reached back, you know, and just got this big old smile on his face. And he said, you're like an angel from God. My perspective was I was prepared to, you know, to start clearing off blows. Yeah. You know, and he was thrilled. Well, why did Jesus have me do that? To reinforce what he had already heard. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then, okay, this next guy is... Now that still, makes sense to me. Yeah. Well, that 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 is how he does it. It's, if I can go back, the mechanism is neutral. Yeah. It's how it's used. It's what spirit is animating that. So... There are times when he 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 wants he needs somebody to be bold enough to go and say something, and usually bold enough means they don't want to do it. The boldness is not in their enthusiasm to do it. Their boldness is to is to is to act in a way that they would prefer not to. 
because they know that's what Jesus wants them to do. That's what boldness is in the kingdom, huh. you know? And so you, you say, okay, I don't really want to do that, but Lord, if this is what you want to do, then let's do it. Well, come to find out that, you know, the guy two years later ended up being installed as the next, you know, pastor went through all of that stuff and they thought it was an impossible thing. Well, there's nothing impossible when Jesus says it. What he says, it will happen. Now, what we want to do quite often and what we're taught to do is to speak boldly for Jesus, quoting scriptures and then ending up obligating him to fulfill because it's written in the Bible. He's not obligated to do one bit of that. And man, that's where the rubber meets the road in our previous vocabulary in this in this episode that, okay, so it's a hard lesson to learn that Jesus just, just is not obligated to anything other than what his father says to him. And that is both frustrating at times because I'd like him to pay attention to what I have to say, meaning I want him to do what I want him to do. And him saying, well, Steve, that's not how this is going to work. That's not the plan that my father has in place. Are you okay with that? Well, I suppose so. It is a wonderful thing that is totally unnerving to come to terms with the immovable Jesus when it comes to truth. He is absolutely immovable, which we might call stubbornness, but in his realm, hey, why would I move apart from what is true? Why would I even do that, Steve? I understand your perspective. I know what you're trying to do. I know what you think in that, but that just isn't true. Are you expecting me to move into what is false? My brain does not know how to process that when he first shared it with me. Yeah. Now it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Well, and when you think about this idea of him being the way, the truth, and the life, it's really interesting to think those terms because you wouldn't naturally, I think, put those terms together. But when you start unpacking them, you know, wow. So what is the kingdom of heaven? You know, that kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If he is the way, the directional way, the truth, which is obviously what we're talking about, this pure light, and what is this real life? Well, we're clearly not living that real life, right? This kingdom life of truth. And it's um, what an invitation it is, too, that in this person is all of this. And it's interesting to me that and this is probably bonus material question here. Is the kingdom and its presence figurative and literal? So, for example, I think a lot of times I imagine this idea of what I read in Revelation of a new heaven and a new earth coming down, right? That I would see something coming down and it would be a separate thing that may integrate here. Right. And it's kind of event oriented. Right. It's a it's a it's this is the time this is it's happening. But then we've often talked about the fact that at certain moments I see, right, the kingdom of heaven is near. Right. Like I see it actually present itself. And I, you know, I think about this idea of like, well, what is I kind of want to daisy chain these experiences of the kingdom right now that I'm experiencing and kind of daisy chain them together. And how would I live my life? Well, in a way that is the kingdom present here. Well, what is that? It's not fearful. It's not, you know, it's abounding in love. It's got all kinds of amazing attributes to it. Is that a, I, obviously you could see it both ways, but is there, how much of, what percentage of it is this idea that, hey, you know, on one extreme, I would say, Let's get a thousand acres, build ourselves a bunker, invite our friends over and build a wall. <laughs> and then let's have some nice kingdom 
conversations, right? Well, that's not, that's obviously extreme and, and not realistic, but there's a certain amount of that where I, I look at this and I go, what does it mean to really have oneness with your wife? What does it mean to have the beauty of a grandchild or, or whatever it is that those moments, which you know, are, you know, divine, right? Yeah. You can see them in art. You can see them in music. You can see them in relationships. You see it in all these places. It's obviously both. And, but what do you think? Is there, it seems like there is some sort of fullness of time that could be described event oriented, but then there's also this experience of it happening. Like it might not be happening in Gaza right now, but it's happening right here on the stream between you and me. And what is that value? And how do I, how do I place that in this context of the kingdom? Yeah. Another great question. Um, Luke 19, it begins with Jesus coming in and having his experience with Zacchaeus. We've talked about this a little bit yeah. in the past. And then as he's going through this various thing, salvation has come to you in your house this day. Well, wait a minute. I, I don't remember seeing Zacchaeus follow any of the you know, he didn't follow the flow chart. Yeah. That's you right. know, to get saved here. How, how did that even work? And yet, and how Jesus, did it affect his household? Yeah. And it went from him to his whole household. What? Wait a minute. Hold on here. See, so right off the bat, yeah. the book is recording something that is 100% contrary to the mechanism that we have been told is appropriate how people get saved. So, Obviously, Jesus has a different picture of what being saved looks like than what we do. He then goes on to tell us, tell a parable. And he's telling, and he tells this parable because the religious leaders who were there had the opinion that the kingdom was about to begin. So they held an opinion. And so Jesus gives them this parable to kind of set them straight. Now, when they finished hearing the parable, I doubt that, that they did anything or benefited at all um, because they, there's no record of them pursuing him and saying, okay, what did you actually mean by this thing? So what we have done is we've carried that model as if the kingdom is going to happen. The kingdom is going to appear. The kingdom, you know, all of a sudden is going to manifest, you know, in this. And yet Jesus, when he answered the prayer, answered the question about the prayer, said, your kingdom come. If you actually look into that word, it says your kingdom come and go. Your will be done. What is the will? Your decrees is one way that that could be said, that your decrees are accomplished, that the things that you have set in place will occur, that your wishes regarding every element in creation would be accomplished. As in, oh, that there's a fascinating word, in. We just think it means, we just translate it as in, but it actually means in and with. So as in and with the heavens, so also upon the earth. What does the word upon means? In those places that are apt and fit for the situation and circumstance. What is that situation and circumstance? Where the Father has decreed something. Now, why am I, why am I saying that? Now, let's back up again, like kind of like our exercise to back up. 
When Jehovah created the garden, let's go back to our friend, and he put Adam and Eve in there, were they experiencing and participating in the kingdom of God at that time? Yes. So what are we worried about it coming? Yeah, it's already here. It, the kingdom precedes us all. Yeah. It's not waiting. F the idea that we are somehow going to materialize the kingdom is a is way off base. What we are going to what we do is we simply desire to participate with Jesus in it, and he brings us into his kingdom. Okay. It's not like we're going to advance the kingdom. The kingdom's already, it, it is totally here. It, it is a reality beyond our experience that we are then invited into to participate with him to complete the work of the kingdom. Don't you think, though, I, I think what gets confusing in, in all of this is these all of the talk of judgment right yeah. all of kind of the the days and times and beginnings and ends and ages and all that stuff that there is a lot of commentary as it relates to event-oriented things yes i I'm, I'm glad to hear you say this because i i would say that makes way more sense but i also recognize that there is kind of a there seems to be an end of an age there seems to be an end of there seems to be um work still that it will be done that is kind of yeah. foretold yeah. i don't want to you know assume that i understand it so it's interesting because you think about him teaching them to pray and those guys were around a long time ago and it's like mm -hmm. well it wasn't they weren't praying for something that happens two thousand years later they were praying for something that would literally be able to happen right then that's i think the thing that encourages me is that your kingdom come honors as it is in heaven is literally like that's the prayer. Yeah. That's the prayer for today. Um, but yeah, I, I don't want to assume that I understand what he will do in the future because he's capable of anything. But I don't know. I I think you know what I'm kind of referring to is like it's well, it's I, really interesting. There's a lot of not it's not conflicting, it's just it's not super concrete to me yet. Well, and, and I would push back and say it's very concrete. What did What is this whole session, you know, this whole stream been about? No, I, yeah, being, I guess what I'm saying is what's not concrete is, for example, my understanding of Judgment Day and of, you know, the dead rising first and heaven and, you know, post, post this life, let's say I'm 80 you know, like this, this death life thing. That's really more what I'm oh. saying. Not, not like, how does the, because I feel like the responsibility and the role of the kingdom as I am here alive, but I'm thinking about eternity after death and what happens after it versus, you know, after, you know, well, if you really look at, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm, I apologize there. Cause I thought you were talking more about the kingdom. Yeah. And so the, what you been talking about in this in this um, stream is one hundred percent about the kingdom. Yeah, I get that. Okay, Matt, have you got that now? Yeah, take that to the next thing. That's very very different. That that life dynamic is very different than the projection into the future, which we kind of talked about last week about Book of Revelation, right? We've converted that from a revelation of Jesus, which it tells us exactly what it's about, to a book that is essentially a sequence of events. Yeah. And we get distracted from the revelation of Jesus in, and moved into the sequence of events. And once we move into the sequence of events, we're no longer viewing the revelation of Jesus from the perspective of the kingdom. We're looking at those sequence of events from the dark light of the upside down world. Yeah. And we can't see them. And yeah. so the if if we want to really look at what's happening in the future, we got to get out from underneath the upside down view. Yeah. Well, which and, you're beginning to do. Well, and <laughs> so the hope of that it is, all, all tie starts tying together. Well, and what the hope of that is is 
is the transfiguration and him chatting, chatting it up with Moses and Elijah. I mean, if there's a hope in this and, you know, today you'll be with me in paradise. Okay. There's something else going on over there. Yeah. This is cool. This is cool. Well, I'm going to have to wrap things up. My wife has been texting the heck out of me. So I've got some things like my two hours are up. Um, Steve, what a wonderful time with you. Thank you so much for, you know, the stuff that you do on the stream, but also off and what a, what I think an important revelation has come in the last week. And so I appreciate it a lot. Hey, and that you're sharing that with your folks is quite amazing because that's, as you've said many, many times, this is not about a pre a session of preaching with one another. It's actually living the deal. Yeah. And, and you are sharing that with the group. So it's got to be a tremendous encouragement to them. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it is. Well, thank you, Steve. Have a great weekend. Okay. Same to you. And and you tell Laura I said sorry. Tell Laura I said sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no worries. You sound, but and you sound great, by the way. Oh, hey, there you go. There you go. The new, so I get the new, words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. That that is really, really good. Okay. Great stream, gentlemen. Thank you. Take care and all have a great weekend. Thanks, David Lee, for you Thanks. as well. Yeah. All right, we'll catch you. Thank you, Steve. Okay. See you. All right. Episode 37 in the books. Wow. Just just the hits keep on coming, folks. What an amazing, what an amazing time. It's really cool. What I love about these things is that they're so applicable because they're universal, right? And that's the thing about truth, right? You can continue to probe it. And that's so neat. So I I hope this was an encouragement to you. It's still living this out, right? So, you know, this is kind of the point of having this is that, you know, being transparent about things, you know, I think we're modeling some of that, Steve is, and just what does this look like? Um, I mean, this is the real stuff right? This is the real stuff that we deal with all the time. And there's so many people in our community who have either experienced difficult times, they're currently going through difficult times. And, you know, really this, this, this core of this whole thing, right? Jesus is alive and he speaks. Really? Does he? Right? Just like my son. Does he really, dad? How does that work? Well, try him on for size, son. That's what he's saying to all of us. Thanks for joining the Pulse today. My name is Matt. This is Crypto Heartbeat. And do not mess with Texas. Take care, everybody.